I always felt like I had to do it by myself. Like it was a solo act and bold is not a solo act. <laughs> I think having, whether it's a friend or a family member or a coach or a mentor or someone, a therapist, knowing that you don't have to go it alone would be my best advice. Because I think for a very, very long time, I had this mindset of like, if I ask for help, it means I've failed. If I don't just get it done and get it done fast, I've failed. So I had this kind of loop going on that was like, I needed to do it by myself. I needed to be strong and not show a lot of weakness. That's just not anything that is okay. Like it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to not succeed at everything. It's okay to ask for help. And so for me, that would be my advice is don't go it alone. Being bold doesn't mean you have to do it solo. That's such a great point. And I think we can even take it the next step and embrace it and look for opportunities to mm -hmm. ask for help and look for opportunities to stumble. And the more we lean into that, I think this is part of your own and learn like that combination of yeah. let's lean into this, the messy stuff and yeah. see what comes out of it. Yeah, because life is messy. Sometimes I really just get frustrated with what we see on social media for ourselves, for our children, for the younger generation. Like it just comes across like everything can happen overnight. Success has a hack, like it, there's a shortcut to this and a shortcut to that. And I'm all for efficiency and agility, trust me, but there's not enough authenticity when it comes to some of the things that we see because it isn't great every day as an entrepreneur. It's hard on certain days. I've shed a tear here and there of frustration. <laughs> it doesn't mean that everything's butterflies and rainbows, but for me, what it means is like, I have this, the highest level of freedom to succeed and fail that's at my fingertips and to me that's a responsibility but it also is very freeing for me in the sense of what it means i can do and what i can accomplish hi and thanks for being part of this community of resilient entrepreneurs today's conversation is with lee burgess and it's about untapped potential collaboration and solving problems for good lee is a regular contributor to forbes and entrepreneur and her podcast is the Bold Lounge Podcast. She was honored as one of Success Magazine's 125 Leaders Making a Difference, and she's currently nominated for Success 50 Women of Influence. Wow. After 20 years in healthcare and in business, Lee went on to build her own Bold Industries Group. Big, B-I-G, get it? Tackling big <laughs> challenges that when solved, make the world a better place. Lee may share her trademarked bold performance formula with us today. We are Resilient Entrepreneurs, your go-to podcast for global business brilliance. We're Vicky and Laura, your co-hosts and the duo behind Two for One Branding, dedicated to empowering new entrepreneurs like you. Today, uh, Lee is here to share invaluable insights, but before we dive in, a quick ask, hit that subscribe button, join our growing community, Together, we're making waves in the entrepreneurial world. And a huge thank you to each of you for helping us pass the 10,000 downloads mark. Lee, a very warm welcome. Great to have thank you Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And congratulations on, on 10K. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We appreciate that. So Lee, tell us your backstory. What kind of kid were you? Were you very entrepreneurial when you were growing up? I think I actually was. So I grew up in rural East Coast, Pennsylvania. So kind of country bumpkin-ish, but not even knowing it. Our family didn't have a lot, but I didn't know that either, the way that we grew up. My first job was mowing lawns, and I think that's where I figured out I was a little entrepreneurial. So I would charge different rates for basically the grade or how difficult the lawn was. And I would also do on demand so that if you wanted it faster, there was a premium service for getting it done sooner than later. Uh, I didn't have a lot of tools. I mean, when I started off, I actually didn't even have the little trimmers. We didn't have a weed eater back in then. I mean, we just didn't have a lot of money. I used scissors. So I think. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, so they were really good scissors. When I wore gloves, I mean, I learned really fast, like how you get blisters and things like that. But I was 13 when I started mowing lawns. So I guess I had a little entrepreneur in me then. Uh, but I think as I went into college and things like that, I really never thought about being an entrepreneur. That is so entrepreneurial, having all the different services. And you <laughs> yeah. were right there on the money, different service levels. And then interesting that 
entrepreneurism didn't really factor in as a career for you. And mm. this is a conversation that Laura and I have between ourselves and with guests is what is that bridge and how can we bring that closer to the forefront so kids are seeing this as a viable career? Yeah, I bet it's better now. I think mine probably was just there's a convention of you go to school, you go to high school, you graduate, you go to college, you get your degrees and you get a job. Like that's kind of, I think, also was expectation of my parents. And I never fought it or thought that wasn't the right thing to do or at any point said I'm going to do X or Y. I was like on the eight year plan for my undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> you hear some people say, oh, I did five years or six years. Mine was eight because in the middle of it, and this might have been the entrepreneur coming out, right? I took multiple years off and I did a whole bunch of different jobs. Like one of my jobs was I traveled with Better Homes and Gardens. I don't know if you remember, this kind of ages me, but they used to do these tours in the shopping malls and that you would be able to like try out the different products and things like that. I was Mott's apple juice. So I would hand out Mott's apple juice and help people get hopefully like it and want to buy it. And so anyway, that's what I did one summer. I just kind of traveled all over the U.S. and did that. And I did some other odd jobs and things like that. At any one time, I usually had at least two jobs. So I was doing multiple things on my own, kind of doing my own thing. Because when I said I wasn't going to stay in school, my parents said they couldn't support that from a financial perspective. And I said, I understood. So from that perspective, I think I just really wanted to, to do a good job and to also be able to kind of do my own thing as well. Yeah, we definitely understand that. And I love yeah. the journey, right? <laughs> I love understanding entrepreneur's journey because I think it really helps new entrepreneurs or people who are just thinking about it or at whatever stage they're in. But to kind of understand that everyone's journey is so unique and so different and it's not like one straight line to success. Oh, it's it's a, it, yeah, it's really a zigzag. And then I didn't think I was being an entrepreneur. I just thought I was like taking my time, doing my own thing hadn't really found what I wanted to be or how I wanted to kind of be in the world. I mean, you're in your 20s. That's the whole point, I think, to figure it out. And even in your 40s, I think I was figuring it out because <laughs> I decided at 48 to quit my job without having a job. That was my big swing of bold. And it really came about because I was burnt out. I had to choose me, right? So I did that. And when I did that, I was like, wow, I could be anything I want to be. So I kind of went back to maybe when I was 13. Oh, I can be anything. I can have any business I want. What do I want to do? But I was having that kind of feeling at 48. So it was kind of like a full circle kind of moment of like, okay, anything's possible, which it always had been. But I don't think I realized it as much until I kind of made that decision for myself. For me, that was a bold decision. And tell us what was the next thing that happened? Like what came after the decision? You, you decided you were burnt out. Then what? Because yeah, I think like, a lot of people are there, right? Or very close to there. Yeah, and on like, that teetering point. Yeah, it's like the, oh, bleep, if you could bleep out a word like moment. And what I mean by that is like, okay, I did it. Now I'm really, I'm in. I am going to move forward. So for me, being bold isn't being fearless. Like there's scary moments. There's moments of the unknown, but it's really moving through it, stepping forward, going for it and learning. Everything's not going to be a success. The what next for me, though, particularly because of the burnout was like I needed to heal, like I needed to get it reset, recalibrate because I, I had gone so far with my mental, my emotional, my physical health that I had backburnered all of that. And I really needed to equilibrate. But what was interesting while I was doing that, getting my own coach, kind of getting reset, I started building the business. I gave my notice at the same time I filed the papers with the state so what was really cool was like my last day of work was the fourth and I got my year incorporated papers on the sixth. So literally I was starting to really be creative and felt this sense of just freedom, although scary freedom at times, but it was this sense of freedom. So it was that close of like my last day to incorporation. So I really felt this just sense of creativity and being able to build and think about things that I hadn't felt before. Yeah. So how do you help people now? Tell us about, a bit about your business now, how you help. Yeah, so I started off, my business model was really to think about how could I help people and work with people that I want to work with. And so, because not everybody's your people, not everybody's a fit for what you do. 
So I created a consulting model called the D90. The D is designed in the 90s, 90 days to kind of put the consulting model on its head. In my particular industry, healthcare consultants come in and they stay a while and they do usually an incredible job, but you don't usually have the bench strength to keep it going or the funds to keep them there. So it becomes like it was great while it lasted, but it doesn't usually last sometimes, you know, when they come in. So I wanted to ask people to radically prioritize and really do it in strategic sprints. So that D90 is what I started with in the consulting model. And it really took off. I started with a list of 15 people I knew and just started talking to people. And those 15 people, not one of those were my first contract. They were just the beginning of the process of getting there. And it took me about four months to get my first client. And I had my own trepidation in there of like, am I doing the right thing? Because I did have a runway. <laughs> it was five months long and I didn't get my first client until the last week of the fourth month. So I had to really be all in on what I call plan A. You really need to have confidence in yourself. Don't doubt yourself. Don't start interviewing other places, which I had at the very beginning of it. So I really had to recalibrate myself to be in on plan A. From there, I added coaching. I added uh, something called the bold retreat. And that was really two years later. So I really started with a base of consulting. And then I thought, okay, this would be nice to bring women particularly together and talk about mindset, strategy, and wellness all in one, all-inclusive event. All you have to do is show up. And we have it in these gorgeous uh, places and spaces. And that kind of like was just something that I thought I would like. So let's see if someone else would like it. So We've had five of those and they have all sold out and in incredible locations and we have a wait list. And then I created the bold table as well. And that was around networking. And I'm a, I guess an ambivert. I prefer to be in small spaces though, like meaning smaller groups, deeper conversations versus kind of the go around the room with 2000 people. I can do it, but my preference is really powering up in smaller groups. So I created this different type of networking event for women that's 40 women and we've done um, eight of those as well and they've all sold out and that has a waiting list and then finally kind of coming into this year wanted to get all bold under one roof because there's a lot of it uh, the, the bold lounge podcast all of the things that we do for mindset and things like that and get it into one which was our bold leaders collective so created a membership in year four as well as wrote the book which will come out uh, later this year so really started, I thought, in a, a thoughtful way, making sure that I knew what I was doing, not trying to do everything all at once. I have done a lot. And when you even just talk about that for four years, that's a lot to do in four years. Just thinking very thoughtfully about how we did it, when we launched, what I learned, because you learned something with each one. Wow. Lee, that really is bold. And so I love that the name of your company is Big Bold Industries Group. Why? Yeah. Are big ideas and big solutions important to you? Well, I think a big idea really can come from a lot of places and it doesn't have to be the size. I think when we think of small or big, we think, oh, it doesn't, it might not have an impact or it might not have this. For me, a big idea could be something simple and in the sense like it's a small change or something that we need to do, but it actually, the impact is big. So I think a big idea is something that we do that actually impacts us or impacts those that we serve in a big way. So, you know, if you think about a big idea might be we don't use plastic bottles, we all use recyclable water containers. That's a very simple idea in the sense of that. But as you can see, that big idea is still one we're struggling with uh, as an example. So, but if we would all do it, it would have great, great, great impact for us. Yeah, I feel you on that. And Vicky and I love working with entrepreneurs that are all about impact because that's super important to us too. And yeah. you can make your impact just in your small niche. Like it doesn't have to be change the whole world. And that's no. what a lot of people get stuck on, I think. Yeah. yeah. How do yeah, you make your a, ripple? I think when I first started off, I had 80 followers in the primarily because I never really did a lot with social media or put myself out there because it's pretty vulnerable and it's kind of a judgy zone. Every now and then, at least it can feel like that. And so I think what I really learned is like your story can be that ripple, your failures, your steps forward, steps back. You just sharing that becomes something for someone else to go, wow, she tried it. It didn't work it like she wanted, but look at her now. Because like every idea I've had, they're not all good. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> they're not all successful, 
or maybe they're successful, but they don't bring me joy or they're not really like, wow, I don't really enjoy doing that. And I'm good at it. And I don't want to fall back into that because that's kind of some of my trip ups in the corporate world where I was really good at things, but I wasn't sure they were as joyful as they were when I first started doing them. So now that I have this choice, I feel like I really try to be more intentional about the things I start. And really, I think you learn a lot when you fail at something, especially as an entrepreneur, because the impact of it can be 10x what it might have been in the, the corporate world. And definitely more personally impacting to you and your business. Right. What is your view of failure and the failure mindset? What's my view of it? I mm. think overarchingly, I live in a growth mindset world. So I, I think that's one of the things my framework is believe, own, learn, design. And the learn is really all about a growth mindset, knowing that when you get to a place of where something doesn't work, it doesn't mean it's the end all be all. It just means it didn't work. <laughs> and I think I've always kind of, I think out of all of the letters of my framework, that's the one I think I feel like I did really well and didn't have a lot to add on when I was going through my own process of healing, because that's when I actually created the framework. Where I had to spend more time were in the believe zone and the own zone. Um, so I think when we think about our beliefs, they can either be helping us or harming us. And we might not know where they came from, or we might know and we might have put it away. So I think for me, I had to unpack some shadows and really had negative self-talk and perfectionism. And even as an entrepreneur, I had never felt imposter syndrome until I was an entrepreneur. I never felt it in the corporate world, but as soon as I became an entrepreneur, I felt it. And so just kind of working through a lot of those. And then ownership for me was I was owning way too much things that weren't my responsibility. So really in the framework, we talk about what should you own and what should you not? And are you celebrating the things that you should? And then the, the L is learned and the D is design. And design is really kind of once you get through it, you're now creating and you're aligning with your passion and purpose and designing the life you were meant to live. Yeah, I like that. So if someone is sort of where you were and feeling like that, and you could give them some advice of some action to take to help them move through the process of getting out of burnout and into healing, like what are some actions people can start taking that you'd recommend? Maybe something that really helped you. Yeah, I think over for me, like I always felt like I had to do it by myself. Like it was a solo act and bold is not a solo act. <laughs> I think having, whether it's a friend or a family member or a coach or a mentor or someone, a therapist, knowing that you don't have to go it alone would be my best advice. Because I think for a very, very long time, I had this mindset of like, if I ask for help, it means I've failed. If I don't just get it done and get it done fast, I've failed. So I had this kind of loop going on that was like, I needed to do it by myself. I needed to be strong and not show a lot of weakness. That's just not anything that is okay. Like it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to not succeed at everything. It's okay to ask for help. And so for me, that would be my advice is don't go it alone. Being bold doesn't mean you have to do it solo. That's such a great point. And I think we can even take it the next step and embrace it and look for opportunities to mm -hmm. ask for help and look for opportunities to stumble. And the more we lean into that, I think this is part of your own and learn like that combination of yeah. let's lean into this, the messy stuff and yeah. see what comes out of it. Yeah. Cause life is messy. Sometimes I really just get frustrated with what we see on social media for ourselves, for our children, for the younger generation. Like it just comes across like everything can happen overnight success has a hack like it, there's a shortcut to this and a shortcut to that and i'm all for efficiency and agility trust me but there's not enough authenticity when it comes to some of the things that we see because it isn't great every day as an entrepreneur it's hard on certain days i've shed a tear here and there of frustration <laughs> it doesn't mean that everything's butterflies and rainbows but for me what it means is like i have this the highest level of freedom to succeed and fail that's at my fingertips and to me that's a responsibility but it also is very freeing for me in the sense of what it means i can do and what i can accomplish 
I think that's it right there in a nutshell, exactly what entrepreneurship is, yeah. you know, that the highs, the lows, the challenges. But one of my favorite sayings is it's all on you and it's all on you. It's talking about impact. You know, you impact your own life so tremendously, but there's no ceiling. Like, that's the beautiful part. Like, you're not just right. working for the next raise or the next promotion or the next thing for somebody else. You can be as wild and creative, as free as you want to be to create anything build anything yeah that is such a good point because i think in the corporate world and i'm not dissing the corporate world like i was in it loved it like it did a lot i learned a lot but it did it was like okay take these five steps and you can do this take these next five steps and you can get a promotion or be up for one take these next steps and if someone above you resigns leaves then you can be promoted like it was very like you were in a holding pattern each time you got to an excel and in my career i was a chief a c-suite in my early 40s so i was like okay what's next and it wasn't like i was expecting a raise or promotion every year but like i wanted to work towards the next goal the next milestone and I did that really quickly. And so I got to a place where there wasn't a what's next. And I think that's when it started getting uncomfortable, like for me in the sense of accomplishment and what I could do and what I could have as impact, probably in my mid 40s. And then I burn out by 48. So it was like those three years, probably I was just in this place of, you know, not knowing kind of what was happening, but it's probably where my closet entrepreneur was really wanting to come out. <laughs> so Lee, what? in your mind is your greatest achievement in business to date in life it's my daughter in business i think from the perspective of that is that not many women i think one are founders so for the particulars of that i think the milestones that i hit in the first four years so six and seven figures of being able to create sales and opportunities and offerings that is very, very unheard of. I remember my coach telling me like only 2% of the women founders do what I did in my first year, but I don't lead with that. But I think I have to remember that is a success story and that I want to share it just so that people realize that it's possible. But what was interesting is I didn't go into it saying I was going to make X amount of dollars. And I think that's really was the difference is I went into this going, I just want to make what I made so that we can go on vacation and I can have a car and we can stay in our house. It was just, I want to make what I made and it wasn't a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so I think from that perspective, because I didn't have that as the goal, I honestly think things happened more readily or faster because of that. So it just kind of proved to me that I could do it. And that felt really, really good uh, to know that I did it. And can continue to do that and take care of my family and do the things that we do to, to live the life we want to live. I think that's confidence. It's the experience of something happening to give you that knowledge that it's possible. And I think we often lack that confidence when we're starting out. Like at the beginning, when you first launched, I bet you never could have seen where you've gotten to now and or even had the confidence, I was right? Mistake left and right. I had my offering as low as $99 an hour at one point for consulting, which is for consultant, that's really cheap, especially <laughs> with someone with 25 years of experience. But I was like, oh, the first person said no, so I must be too high. So let me swing so far to the left that it's now too low. Of course, that person said yes, but it was not the best engagement for me because I felt devalued the majority of it. And they felt like, I don't know, like it wasn't the most, it was not the best experience. So yeah, like I failed left and right when I was starting off, but you start to gain that confidence that you said. And I think that's one of the myths I write about in the book. I think there's a myth that boldness means you're confident all the time. And that doesn't, <laughs> it does not equate. You have confidence that you're gaining, but it doesn't mean you're just like confident and like, I'm so going to do this and no matter what, it's going to be great. Like sometimes you're just like, wow, I hope it works. And you it hits send. <laughs> such an experiment and such a joy. And yeah. yeah, talking about experimenting, you've launched a number of services in the four mm -hmm. years. Tell us about your launch experience and what would you say is a winning formula? Well, I've definitely honed that and my team will tell you that I've gotten better at it. But like there are times that I've just probably, well, not probably, I've done it in a way that creates too much pressure, meaning doing too much at one time. So for example, my last launch, 
not my book, but the collective. So creating the membership, which is a pretty big launch. We were doing the redo of our website at the same time we were launching the collective. And both of those are heavy lifts on your team. So I think for me, the winning formula would be to not overlap things, whether one feels like, oh, that's just our day to day. We're going to the next level of our website. It's still a project. It's still a big deal. And especially if you have people overlapping, I mean, I have a smaller team, team of five. So like doing those types of things, like it, you can really pressurize your team. So that was the learning I had. For me, the formula is really make sure that you, you're you thoughtful, that you're not just doing it because you think it's X, Y, or Z. Like I didn't launch a community to obviously be the main revenue producer or anything like that. I launched it because I wanted to get all my offerings under one roof. I wanted to create a space and for the community, for the women leaders in it. And I wanted to be able to have them be able to connect with one another and do events specifically with them and have them be able to come together. So I think you have ideas, but it has never been that I'm doing this because it's going to make me a lot of money. I'm not writing a book because I'm going to make a lot of money around the book. Now, my saying money is not important. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm just saying it's not the end goal when I'm launching something. So I think sometimes early on, I think people do things that are they launch too many things because they want to make revenue. Obviously it's important, They but they want to do it in a way I think that's, they think it's going to be fast. And I think that can be not a good formula to have. Yeah. Let's talk about community for a minute because you just mentioned it. And I think we don't understand... I don't know, maybe people do understand the value of community, but I think as an entrepreneur, especially the solo entrepreneur, you're starting something out, you're building something and you're doing it all by yourself and you feel very lonely. And we know that is an issue and a reason a lot of entrepreneurs quit, right? Because of that, they're on their own. They don't know what they're doing. They're making mistakes. They don't have support. Maybe their family doesn't get what they're doing. So let's just talk about like the value of community and why what's building a community important to you and what do people get out of that community? So I think for me, what I started to do in 22 with my first event, which was the bold retreat that I tried. And my first event took three months to sell. I had to do a lot of different things. But what happened from that was a curated group of women coming together. So 15 women coming together for the retreat. And what I noticed in that first retreat was the community that they created, that I created this space. And I say they create the magic. And It's the connection. It's the getting to know you. It's the, oh, you have a dog and two kids. Oh, you like to cook. What's your favorite dish? Kind of the horn. I think at times we become either our title or profession or where we went to school or X, Y, or Z. And what it started to kind of turn on light in my head was it's looking at someone in a whole 360 degree fashion human being of who they are. And for me, it was like, how do I do more of that? Because what we did together was in my first offering, we stayed together for the whole year. So we went to the retreat. I did coaching, group coaching for the whole year with that group. And so they were together all year in coaching and with me. And some of them did individual coaching with me. And so our relationships deepened. And I was like, how do I do more of that? And so that's where we started doing the bold tables and the members from the retreat would come to the bold table. They would fly in. Most of the people who come to the bold table actually fly in from all over the country, no matter where I have it. And we have it in different places and they come together. So I was like, okay, how do I do more of that? So it was like this, as you can see, kind of this, how do I create more connection and community and places and spaces for them to do it? And that's really after four years getting to that point, multiple retreats, multiple bold tables, coaching and doing the things I was doing. It was like, okay, I think we have a a really special place. We have a hundred members. So since August, late August of last year to now through February, I got a hundred members and I stopped. So I purposely closed at a hundred because I wanted to grow thoughtfully. I wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing. I want to make sure that they're getting the value out of everything that we do. And it is the primary point of being part of the Bold Leaders Collective is connecting in a 360 degree way. I'm in there every day asking a survey and it could be like a leadership survey. It could be, what are you reading? It could be, do you put your Christmas up before Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving? I mean, those are really strong feelings about this. (laughs) (laughs) So totality of who we are, share your wins, which is 
so interesting. It's one of the hardest things to get out of this group is like brag, brag about yourself. So I think it's a great space to bring in speakers and have like a, a place and a space for them to connect. And we're coming up on, we're doing an event in New York in just a couple of weeks. It's called the Bold Summit and we're doing a bold table on the other side of it. And, and again, it's just creating that space in person. So it's a virtual in-person type of moment for our community to come together and just creating that space for them has really been my goal. Why is creating connection important to you, Lee? What's underneath? Probably because I think the most of my career, I don't think I had it. I think it was lacking. Like I've always felt like I've had personal connection, like with my parents and with my siblings and with my husband and with my daughter. Like I've always felt that's very strong, but I think I felt very lonely as a female leader in a very competitive corporate world. And not because anybody did anything wrong or anybody wronged me. I mean, certainly everything wasn't perfect, but I don't think I ever felt accepted I guess is the right word because I wasn't when in the corporate setting, like they don't want to see all of you like all the time. It's hard to like, how do I turn on my authenticity, but still like make sure I understand the politics and history of the organization and not talk too much and not be, it's just a lot of rules. So I think it wore me out a bit. And then therefore what happens when I get in that space is I just kind of recess. Like I'm not going to be going to a lot of networking. I don't really want to put myself out there. I'll do my job and do it really well, but I'm not really into anything else. So I think partially like I felt alone because I wanted to be alone. <laughs> and the other part of it was like, I'm not sure I felt welcomed. So I think for me, and no one's ever asked me that question. So I think it's a really good question. It's just, I probably wanted to create a space that I never had and that it was okay to be me, to fail, to brag about myself. And by brag, I just mean say, hey, I did this. I wrote this article. I published this. I spoke here. That's the kind of bragging I'm talking about. I made bread and it didn't fall. No, I went to that exercise class. I said, doing those things are all wins. So I think for me, I just wanted to create a space probably that I wish I had. They say that about you write a book that you want to read, you know, that you need to read. So I probably created a space that I needed probably most of my career. And celebrating the wins is so important. Like even those small wins, the small steps, little things that get you along, the 10,000 downloads on a podcast, that's yeah. a big win. <laughs> you know, but celebrate it. Like let's get excited yeah. about it and celebrate it. And as women, I don't think we're good at that. Are we taught to be humble? Is it just expectation culturally? I'm not sure exactly, probably very individual in that way, but there definitely is a humility and as an entrepreneur who has to promote themselves, mm -hmm. you kind of got to get out of that a little bit, right? So you have to be bold. You have to show up on social media. You have to promote your business and yourself and your retreats or whatever you have going on in your business. And that can be really hard for people. Yeah. And people can be jealous. I think when you start to gain confidence or do some of the things that will make you uncomfortable, but maybe no one knows it makes you uncomfortable. Like most people say, I can't believe you're even thinking you're an introvert. I'm like, well, I think I am. But I think what's interesting is that might irritate other people's, whether they had a move they wanted to make and now you're irritating them because you've made it and you're showing up and they wish they had. So therefore something negative is said or or something isn't positive for them. I think that's really hard. At least that was hard for me when I first started. Was I thought everyone would be happy for me. I thought everyone would be like, wow, that's a cool idea. Like, yeah, go for it. And people were just like, what did you do? Why did you leave? What are you doing? What's it called? And I just really quickly had to shift gears and go, okay, like you're not in my inner circle. Maybe not for now or maybe not forever, but you're going to like move out to the outer edges. And I'm going to really kind of hone in to the people who belong to in the center of kind of like hearing my ideas and knowing what I'm doing. And I think that's really important, too, because when you first set out, I just wanted to tell everybody my ideas. I'm in Target checking out. Yeah, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm thinking about this or that. Like I was talking it up, but you might want to make sure you, people deserve to hear what you have to say. Because for me, I just thought everybody would be happy for me, but they weren't. Yeah, that can come as a surprise. Have you had to let anybody go in your life because of it? Uh, I don't think I let anybody go. I think I just moved out of ring. And then once I'm up and going, then maybe there's a little bit more conversation. But for me, I think the thing I had to let go were people who wanted to live in the past. 
where the only thing I had in common was the strife. That's so challenging. Or can you believe X did that? And why did that? Like those people definitely, I think are no longer in my life because the only thing we had in common was the, a challenge and they didn't really, I don't think want to get out of it. They wanted to kind of have that as something that they kind of perseverated on and, and stayed in. And I was over it. I'm moving on. Like, I think you learn from the past, but I don't think you need to, I don't want to live there. When you just even said that, I felt my stomach heat up. I just, the very, <laughs> that whole, it's a community of people that stay there because they maybe don't think they have the courage to do the things that you're doing or that someone mm -hmm. else is doing. And maybe they've given up on a dream and they've really resigned themselves to not leaning into that dream anymore. And so right. they do everything they can to create the comfortable space so that it's okay for them, but it's not okay for us. I mean, right. we're in that space. We just have to have separation and in a kind and loving way. And just think if that's where you want to be, go for it. Self-acceptance, it, make your decision yeah. and be okay with your decision. But then yeah. you know, they, there's no room for them to try and bring others down. It brings to mind the saying, you know, the Marianne Williamson, playing small to make others feel better. It's not our role. Our role is to shine our light as bright as mm -hmm. we can in doing so gives them permission to do the same. Should they choose? Yeah. And if they yeah. don't choose, cool, all good on you. Yeah. It's easier said than done at times. And I think, especially when you're first starting as an entrepreneur, it's harder. I think it's not that I've gotten thick skin because you can see it like on my sweater, like my heart is on my sleeve <laughs> on wow. purpose because that's kind of how I live. But I think it doesn't sting as long or as maybe as deep as it does when you first start out. I mean, you're human, so I think you're going to feel some things every now and then. But I think you also realize and you're able to identify like, oh, this actually brought up something in them. This has nothing to do with me. I don't own it. And I think I'm way better at that. That's a skill I wish I would have had in the corporate world that I really didn't gain until I became an entrepreneur. But I used to think it was all personal. It was about me. It was about something that I did wrong or could do better, X, Y, or Z. And now that I look back, I, I can look at a lot of those situations and go, it had nothing to do with me at all. But I took it personal and therefore like it led to this or that or this. So I think that's one thing that as an entrepreneur, I think I've gotten better at as well is just to be able to know when to take something in and when to totally just let it fly by. I don't need to take that on. And yeah. it's all experience, isn't it? We don't know yeah. about these things until we experience something that m makes us go deeper inside and really work out what's going on. Is it me? Is it them? And entrepreneurism certainly gives us plenty of those opportunities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we get a lot of practice in, the, in that area. <laughs> yeah. I always say it's like the best personal development course you'll ever go on. It's just the experience of being an entrepreneur because you don't realize how deep you've got to go and how many things you've got to figure out and how many things you've got to learn about yourself when you're going through it. Because, it yeah, it's not just your business. <laughs> it no, is not. It's therapy. I just wish I would have done it sooner. I don't want to erase the past or erase my experiences or those type of things. But maybe if I could have just done it sooner with all the experience I had, I would like be ahead. I think that's the other thing is like, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, when I'm supposed to be there, how I'm supposed to be there. And I'm learning lots of things still. So I think that's the one thing that I've just remind myself that I'm not behind. I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. And something I always say to people I coach and my clients is like, what's meant for you will not miss you. And that's not my quote that someone else's, but it is so true. So I chase a lot less now than I did in the beginning and also when I was in the corporate. So it's just like, I don't do that. And I look back now and I can see where maybe I was chasing things in year one, like whether it be a client or an idea or funding or something like that. But I think I've settled into kind of, it's going to work out. It just is going to work out. And in certain days you're like, Ooh, I don't know if it's going to work out, but you're like, yes, it is. And so I think you get better and better at that with the experiences you have too. Yeah. hundred percent. 
So we've talked a lot about resilient type things, but not specifically the word resilience. So of course we're resilient entrepreneurs, so we must talk about that. So yeah. what in your opinion is the thing that makes someone resilient? What, what do they need to have? If you would ask me like what resilience means to me, I think it's kind of a combination of obviously the get knocked down, get back up, which might be some of the things you've heard before. But for me, a resilience also comes from a vulnerability of knowing that it's okay to fail and it's okay to get back up and and it's okay to talk about your failures. And I go back to kind of what I've learned and we talked about earlier is resilience is knowing that success is a cycle and you're not always going to be able to say everything I did, I knocked it out of the park. And so I think for me, when it comes to, to being resilient, it's just knowing that it's going back to what I just said. It's going to be okay. We're going to learn from it. We're going to keep moving forward. And there's a new day. As long as you wake up in the morning, it's already a good day. So I think being thankful and being able to understand that is a really a big piece of being resilient. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you, Lee. This is sure. such a wonderful conversation. It really is. And we would very much like to flip things around for a moment. And All right ourselves in the hot seat you can ask us a question it's something okay. we start doing on this podcast and it seems to be a bit of fun so yeah, what's your definitely. question for laura and i yeah definitely so one of the things i always like to ask people is what is your definition of bold and then second question like kind of just to follow that up when you tell, share your definition is when you define it for yourself when's a memorable moment of boldness for you Laura's saying I go first. <laughs> All right, Laura's going first. What does bold mean to you, Laura? Oh, I get to go first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think bold is doing the thing that scares you and doing it anyway, like no matter what. And I think when something does scare you and you have that nervousness, that nervous energy, that feeling in the pit of your stomach, that why did I say yes to this thing? And when you're doing it mm -hmm. anyway, that is bold because that is the thing that you most need to do. I really believe that. And I would say that to somebody today, like, oh, I'm so nervous about this speech. I'm like, that's because you care about it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be nervous about the thing if you didn't care about it. You'd just be like, whatever, right. something I have to do. So when you accept nervousness as just a feeling of, I care about this thing and it's important to me, I feel like that is what makes it possible for you to just leap in and do the thing. Yeah. As for me, um, my personal moment was, it's kind of a series of moments, but it was becoming an entrepreneur was definitely a really bold leap for me. I kind of fell into entrepreneurship. I've talked about this in the past where I was made redundant when I was pregnant with my daughter. But I had a safety net then as that I had a partner and I had a house and I had some things. But the real, real Mem most memorable time for me is when I left all of that and became a single mom on my own as an entrepreneur and I had to figure it all out on my own. And I just did it. Like I remember just packing the furniture in the truck and I just moved. So within two hours, I went from one house to another and settled myself. And it was the most empowering, most incredible thing that I've ever done. I still look back and go, wow, <laughs> like yeah. that was something. And I've never looked back and I've only grown from there and it's only given me more confidence. So that was my big sort of defining was that packing that truck and just I like I'm moving. seeing like the closing of the door when you flip that big lock thing over which is sometimes I can't get it right but like that's what I'm like envisioning you like yeah it's like, like that done. slam of like it's yeah, done it's we're gone. moving it's that it's symbol yeah. of moving yeah really yeah. really is powerful yeah very bold moment well thank you for sharing that sure yeah thank you for sharing your story that's a tough one to follow <laughs> <laughs> well, what's bold mean to you to me, actually, these days, I would probably have answered this very differently years ago, but these days, to me, bold means true self-acceptance. Really I love that. being okay with what I want. Like A little bit like we were just talking about, not worrying about what other people are going to say or think. Just truly accept where I am and what I want and then mm -hmm. going for it. That's bold. For me, the bold part is the accepting that what I want is great. That's what I want. Because Laura knows we've been on this journey for several years now and my bugbear has always been untapped potential, untapped potential. I feel like I'm living 80% of my life and I want to live 100. I carry on about it. Ridiculous. Yeah. And yet 
my example of boldness is just in the last year was really accepting what it is that my heart wants and leaning into it and going for it. And that so starting up a side business that complements what we do, Laura and I do so beautifully. You accepted that you're actually already successful, that there isn't another, when you talk about untapped potential, like your definition of yourself and how you see yourself needed to change, which is a bold move. Like, especially for women, I think, I'm not saying it's not hard for men, but I think I lived experience. It's sometimes hard to say like, shouldn't I be doing more? Shouldn't I be doing the next level? And to say like, no, I'm actually rocking it because I'm happy. I find joy. I have space for what I want in my life and may not be on somebody's chart of like that success. But in my world, in my definition, that's success. So congratulations on that. Because I think that's hard to learn and it's hard to do. And it's absolutely a bold move. Yes, thank you. That means the world just to hear you say that, Lee. Because sometimes yeah. you know, we have the imposter syndrome too. And we have the, does anybody care? Is anybody out there even listening? We don't know. But you just got to keep taking Over bold, 2, bold steps. Plus are listening. Hello. So somebody is listening. <laughs> thank you, everyone out there listening. And thank you. Thank you, Lee, for, for joining us today. This has been an incredible conversation. I absolutely love what you do so much and helping people become bold and take those big, bold steps in their life. To take the risk, to do the thing, to just take the action, to be yourself, self-acceptance, Vicky. I mean, that's yeah. incredible. And I think that's what we all should be striving for because we're all out here doing our thing, figuring it out. And yeah. it's incredible. There's no limits. And when you're, you're an entrepreneur... Alone. You're yeah. not alone. Look, there's yeah. communities. Lee has a community for you. She's got a book coming out. Super excited for you for that. Please keep us uh, in the loop when that's published. Definitely. And yeah. we'll share it with our community too. And yeah, just keep doing great, big, bold things, Lee, because we need more like you out there helping the rest of us get there too. So thank you so much for today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Resilient Entrepreneurs. We hope you enjoyed hearing from our amazing guest, and learn something new about resilience and entrepreneurship. Remember, resilience isn't just a trait, it's a skill that can be learned and developed. And if you wanna stay connected with us and hear more inspiring stories, be sure to hit that subscribe button and follow us on social media. And if you know somebody who's a resilient entrepreneur and would be a great guest on our show, we wanna hear from you. Please reach out. Thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next episode of Resilient Entrepreneurs.